In this example problem, we will first create an unfactored moment axial load interaction diagram by hand uh, for the section shown here. Then we'll add our load factor or add our resistance factors in, so we'll create a factored moment axial load interaction diagram. We'll use a provided Excel spreadsheet tool to create an unfactored and factored moment axial load interaction diagram. Then we'll determine the capacity of the column if we had an eccentricity in both the x and the y direction, so if we had a biaxially loaded column. We'll mo then modify our moment axial load interaction diagram to include slenderness effects. And finally, we'll plot a couple uh, demand points on our design curve and, and comment on where those points fall. We'll start this example by finding our unfactored moment axial load interaction diagram, and we're going to find five main points on this diagram by hand. We'll start by finding our pure axial compression point, then our balance point, our tension controlled point, our pure bending point, and then pure tension. The first step that we would need to do is, is find the plastic neutral axis for our section. Because our section is symmetrical, our plastic neutral axis is just going to be equal to h over 2. But if we had a non-symmetrical section, uh, like the one shown here, what we can do is we can find our, our total force, and then we can find our plastic centroid by taking the forces times the lever arm from either the bottom or the top, and then divide by our, our total force here. So again, because we have a symmetrical section, our plastic neutral axis is going to be located at the centroid of the section, just h over 2. So we'll start by finding our pure compression point. And with our pure compression point, we're going to assume that we have a strain equal to 0 0.003 across the depth of the section. The 0 0.003 is the assumed strain that our concrete will crush at uh, in our section. And we can look at our stress and force diagram and see the uh, compression block, we're going to use a 0.85 F prime C for the magnitude of our stress in our concrete. Just That's what we're going to use moving forward with our rectangular stress block, so we're going to use it here for consistency between the points. Then we have our, our three forces from our three layers of steel, all in compression. So we can add together our concrete component and our steel component to get our total axial force at this point. So our total axial force N is going to be equal to 0.85 times F prime C, which is 6 KSI, times our gross area, 14 inches squared, minus, we have eight uh, bars with an area of 0.6 square inches. And then we add in our steel area here, so eight, times 0.6, times the yield strength of that steel, 60 KSI, and we can get a total axial force here of 1,263.1 kips. So this is our axial load uh, at our pure compression point. The next point that we're going to find is our balance point, and the balance point here is when our steel yields or reaches the compression controlled limit strain limit, and when the concrete strain is equal to 0 0.003. So here, 0 0.003 at the top fiber, compression strain, and we have a tensile strain here equal to the compression controlled limit, which is the yield strain for our steel, uh, so epsilon y. So a linear strain profile, we're assuming plane sections remain plane, so we can find our neutral axis depth using this equation here. So our neutral axis depth will be equal to then 0 0.003 divided by 0 0.003 plus epsilon y, uh, where our epsilon y here is going to be equal to 0 0.00207, and then all this times d, 12 inches, which will give us a c here of 7.1 inches. We can then use our linear strain profile and uh, with this C of 7.1 and our known strain at the top of 0 0.003, and we can calculate the strain at, at the different, or at the top layer and middle layer, the stress at those layers, and then the ultimate, and then the force in those layers. 
So we can start with the strain here. So we'll have 0 0.003 divided by 7.1 inches times our C 7.1 minus 2 inches, the distance from the top to the center of our top layer of steel. And we'll get a strain here equal to 0 0.00215. So this is greater than our epsilon SY, our yield strain. So our stress is just going to be equal to 60 KSI. The force, total force in this layer then is going to be equal to, we have three bars there with an area of 0.6 square inches um, times 60 KSI, which will give us a total force of 108.0 kips. So this is the force in our top layer of steel. We can keep going and find the strain, stress, and force in layer two and strain, stress, and force in layer one and our concrete force. And here we need to make some assumptions on our, our signs. Um, so we're gonna assume here that uh, positive is compression for our layer two. So we're gonna find the compression force here. And we can just think about whether our steel layer is above or below our neutral axis. So let me just plug in some numbers and I'll talk about that more. So we have our strain in layer two is going to be 0 0.003 divided by C 7.1 times 7.1 minus seven inches, the distance between the top and the centroid of that second layer of steel. And we'll get this equal to uh, point zero 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 four three one um, so we can see here that our c is greater than uh, the the distance from the top to the centroid of that second layer of steel so our second layer of steel is above the neutral axis and this means that that layer is going to be in compression if that middle layer is below the neutral axis then uh, it'll be in tension and our sign would switch in here but we just need to know what a a negative sign means and you know what, what our assumption means so that's what that means there so then we can come back and take that strain that we found 0 0.00004311 times the modulus of elasticity for our steel 29,000 ksi and we'll get a stress of 1.3 ksi we can take this uh, 1.3 times our two number seven bars, so point, or two times 0.6 square inches times 1.3 KSI. And we'll get a force here of 1.5 kips. So that's our force in our middle layer. The concrete force, we're going to use our rectangular stress block uh, equation here. So we'll have 0.85 times beta one for six KSI concrete is going to be 0.75. Our F prime C is six KSI. Our C 7.1 we found. And then our B is given as 14 inches, the width of the compression block. So then we'll get a compression force in the concrete equal to 380 0.3 kips. Our tension layer, uh, our balance point by definition, uh, we have the strain in the layer equal to the yield strain. So it'll be 60 KSI. So we can just take our three number seven bars, three times 0.6 square inches times 60 KSI, which will give us a force here of 108.0 kips. We can then add all these forces together to get our total axial load in the column. So uh, to do this, and we need to make sure that we use the right signs. So we're going to use positive for compression and negative for tension. So as we add these together, just note the signs. So our top layer of steel, 108 kips, plus the middle layer is still in compression, 1.5 kips plus our concrete force, which is 380.3 kips, and then minus our tension force, 108 kips. So we'll get a, a total force here of 381.8 kips. 
So that's our axial force at this point. We're now ready to find the moment at the balance point. And to, to do this, we'll need to find all of our lever arms for our different forces. The steel lever arms are all going to be the same throughout the problem because we're going to sum our moments about the plastic neutral axis or plastic centroid here. And so our lever arm here is going to be the distance between the plastic centroid and the top layer. So seven inches minus two inches. So seven minus two is going to be five inches. And that's going to be the same distance between the centroid and the top layer and the centroid and the bottom layer. So five inches, five inches there. The lever arm for the middle steel, the, our middle steel is located at the same level as our plastic neutral axis. So we're going to have a no lever arm for that middle layer. So the middle layer is not going to contribute to our moment at all. So just note in this equation here, I don't include the um, middle layer, but that's because we have no lever arm here. Uh, last, we have our concrete lever arm, and to find our concrete lever arm, we need to uh, look at for the distance between the plastic centroid and the centroid of our compression block. So here we'll have uh, h minus y bar, so I, I write in kind of general notation, or 7 inches, minus 0.75 beta 1 times c, 7.1, divided by 2. And it'll give us a lever arm here of 4.34 inches. Note that this lever arm is going to change for each one of our points because our compression block depth is going to change. So while the 5 inches, 0 inches, and 5 inches is going to remain the same for all the points, uh, our 4.34 here, our, our lever arm for our concrete, is going to change for each point. So uh, next, we're going to move on and, and calculate our moment. So we can think about which way the mo or which way the forces are going to contribute to the moment. So here we have uh, counterclockwise for the top steel, counterclockwise for the compression block, and then also counterclockwise for the bottom. So all of the the moment terms are going to be additive. So all of our signs are positive. So uh, plugging these into our, our moment equation, we'll have 5 inches times 108 kips plus 4.34 inches times our C sub C, 380.3 kips plus 5 inches times the force in the bottom, steel, 108 kips. And we'll get a moment here equal to 2,729 kip inches. So this is the moment for this point and the axial load for this point on the previous slide we, we found, um, or we found on the previous slide. Okay, so then the last thing that we can do is we can figure out the, or we can calculate the curvature at this point. And the curvature is just going to be the slope of our strain diagram. So we know our top point, 0 0.003, our top strain, and we know our C, 7.1 inches. So we can calculate our curvature then to be 4.2 times 10 to the negative fourth radians per inch. So those are our curvature uh, at ultimate at this point. Our next point is our tension controlled point. And our tension controlled point is the point when the strain in our steel is equal to our tension control limit when our concrete at the top crushes or, or has a, a strain value of 0 0.003. So 0 0.003 in the top and a strain at the center of the steel equal to the tension controlled limit, 0 0.005 in this case. So with our linear strain diagram, we can solve for C from the strain diagram using the same procedure that we did before. And here we can find the C to be equal to 4.5 inches. So we can see our neutral axis is uh, kind of, it, it's less than at our balance point, the neutral axis depth. So with that neutral axis depth, we can plug in and we can calculate our strain, stress, and force in, in our different layers of steel in our concrete compression block region. So first our strain in our steel layer three, we can calculate here. We can see that it's less than the yield strain in the steel. Uh, so we have, we can take the strain 
times our modulus for the steel to give us a stress in this layer of 48.3 ksi. Taking that times our three number seven bars will give us a, a force in this layer of 87 kips. Continuing on, we can calculate the strain, stress, and force in our middle layer of steel. And we can see that the centroid of this layer is below our neutral axis depth, so we're going to have tension in our steel. So I, you can see I, I have a, a tension force here, uh, assuming that our force, or yeah, assuming that our steel is in tension at this point. Um, if we left these as the, the same as the previous point, we would have a negative compression, so the, the signs would work themselves out here. Uh, the, the concrete force we can find similar to the last point, uh, modifying our uh, C here, so 4.5 and a C to calculate the com concrete compression force as 241 kips. And then the strain in our bottom layer steel, our layer one is still greater than yield. So we'll still have the same stress and uh, the yield stress and the same force as the previous point. So adding these together, we can get our, our axial force as shown here. Similar to the balance point, we can now find our moments. And we'll again sum our moments by taking our forces times the distance between the plastic centroid and the centroid of that force. Um, so here again, our lever arm in the top and bottom layer is still going to be five inches. The concrete lever arm is going to vary with our neutral axis depth or the depth of our compression block. So we can calculate that using this equation here to find that to be 5.31 inches. And then again, we can take our moments equal to our uh, forces times our, our lever arms, uh, noticing again that uh, all of our forces are going to be in the counterclockwise direction. So all of the forces will be additive. So all these force components are going to be additive again. So we can do that and we can find again our, our moment in this case to be uh, 2,255 kip inches. Uh, finally, we can also calculate our curvature again by taking the strain here at the top, 0 0.003 divided by C, so assuming small angles, and we'll get a, a curvature equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative fourth uh, radians per inch. Our next point is the pure bending point, and this is when we have no axial force in the column, so n is going to be equal to zero. We don't have, where we don't know two strains across the depth, we only know the top fiber strain. So what we're going to need to do is we'll need to calculate, or we're going to need to find uh, each of our forces in terms of c, and then sum our forces together and set them equal to zero. So have our n equal to zero and solve for C using this equation here. So the first thing that we'll do is we can calculate the force in each of the layers uh, in terms of C. And we're going to need to make some assumptions as to which layers are yielded and which layers are, are unyielded. Uh, first, we're looking at layer three. We're going to assume that this layer is in compression and unyielded. So we can solve for our strain using our strain diagram in terms of C. So leaving C as a variable, uh, take that strain times our modulus and take that stress times our area to get our force. So here we're going to have three number seven bars times the modulus 29,000 KSI and then times our strain 0 0.003 divided by C times C minus two. So simplifying this, we'll get uh, our force equal to 156.6 times C minus two over C. So we'll use this then in this equation. Next, we'll need to find our other strain, stress, and force components. Uh, assuming diff whether different layers are yielded or unyielded. And we can start with our steel layer two. Uh, here we're going to assume that we have, in this layer it's going to be yielded. So we'll have the yield stress 
and our force is just going to be two number seven bars, so two times 0.6 square inches times 60 KSI the yield stress, which will give us a force in that middle layer of 72 kips. Next here in our concrete layer, we can solve for our, solve for our compression force using our compression block equation, um, and we'll leave C as a variable. So here we have 0.85 times 0.75, our beta one for our six KSI concrete. C is left in variable term and we have a B equal to 14 inches. So we'll get here a compression force equal to 53.6 times C. So next we have our steel layer one. And again, we're going to assume that this layer is yielded. So we have the yield stress here and take that times our three number seven bars to get our total force equal to 108.0 kips. So at the end, we'll need to check our different assumptions. You know, we assumed the layer one was yielded and we assumed layer two was yielded and we assumed layer three was unyielded. So we'll need to go back and check these assumptions at the end. But next, what we can do is we can sum these forces and set them equal to zero. So that's what I'm doing here in, in this step. So plugging in our, our known values, we'll have uh, 156.6 times C minus two over C uh, minus 72 kips plus uh, 53.6 C minus 108 kips equal to zero. So uh, putting this in uh, terms of a quadratic, we'll have 53.6 C squared minus 23.4 C minus 313.2 equal to zero. And from this, we can use the quadratic formula to solve for C, which will be equal to 2.65 inches. So this is the neutral axis step or the C that we'll use to go back and, and check our, our strain stresses and forces in, in our different layers and, and ultimately calculate all of our forces. Now that we found our C, our neutral, neutral axis depth, we can check all of our different assumptions and calculate our force components. So checking our, our first assumption that our steel layer two and steel layer one are yielded, we can plug in our C into our strain diagrams, assuming again, a, a linear strain profile. And we can see that the strain in layer two and strain in layer one are both greater than our yield strain. So both of these assumptions uh, check. Next, we can come and we can look at our st uh, steel layer three force. Um, so plugging in our C into this equation, we can find our, our steel force equal to 38.3 kips. We can remember our force uh, of 108 kips when our, our, um, when our steel was all yielded in this. And we can see our force is less than this. So remember this was uh, when all of our steel was yielded. So we can see that this, this force is less than the 108 kips. So our top steel is unyielded. And then the final force that we need to find is our concrete force. So again, plugging in our C into our concrete force equation, we can calculate our, our concrete force here. We can check our, or we can double check that our axial load equals zero by summing all of our force components, making sure our signs are, are correct. So. Uh, putting in our, our compression is positive, tension is negative, we would find an axial force of zero. So we can see that our C checks. The last portion here, uh, we can calculate our moment like we did before. Remember our, our steel lever arms are still going to be five inches. Those will be the same. And the concrete lever arm we can find using the same equation that we did before. So plugging in our, our terms, uh, seeing again that uh, we're going to be counterclockwise with all of our um, moment com or force components or force couples, or, sorry, uh, force times distances. So we can uh, add all of our components together and adding all those components, we'll get a moment equal to uh, 1,583 kip inches. 
Uh, the last thing here, I find the curvature for us. And again, just taking our 0 0.003 top fiber strain divided by C uh, to get a curvature here of 11.3 times 10 to the negative fourth uh, radians per inch. The last point that we're going to find is our pure tension point. So this is pure tension, so no moment and only tension tension forces. So for this, we're going to assume that our, our strain is greater than the yield strain at all the layers. And we'll assume that we have a, a linear strain or a, a constant strain profile across the depth of the section as shown here. Uh, because we have tension, we're going to assume we don't have any uh, tension force in our concrete. So the only tension force is provided from our three layers of steel. So we can find our axial force then just by taking the total area of steel times the yield stress for our steel. So here we have our total area is our eight number seven bars. So eight times 0.6 square inches times 60 KSI, which will give us a, a total force here of 288 kips. And remember this will be in tension. So when putting all this together, we're going to have a, a negative sign in there to represent tension. So this table shows us a, a summary of all the, the five points that we found. So pure compression, no moment, only compression force, only compression axial force. Balance point where our top fiber uh, strain was equal to 0 0.003 at the same time that our steel yielded or was equal to the balance point uh, or compression controlled strain. Our tension controlled point where when we have uh, 0 0.003 at the top, we have a tension controlled strain at our bottom layer of steel. Uh, pure moment, so pure moment, no axial load, and pure tension. So we can see our axial load is going to decrease uh, for each of these points, and our, our moment also slightly decreases between the balance point and pure moment point. So balance point, we have our maximum moment. Pure compression, we have our maximum compression axial, axial force. And pure tension, we have our maximum axial tension force. You can see our, our C is going to decrease between the balance point and pure moment point. And because the C decreases, the strain or the compression strain and compression stress in our top layer of steel is going to decrease. And the tensile strain in the middle layer is going to increase, uh, tensile strain and tensile stress in the middle layer is going to increase, and the tensile strain and tensile stress in the bottom layer is going to increase as well, uh, but, uh, up until we yield the steel. And you can see that the compression force, because our C is decreasing, the uh, compression force from the concrete, so the from our co concrete compression block, is going to also uh, decrease between these points. So that concludes this, this first part of the example. For the next part of this example, we're going to add in our resistance factors to develop a factored moment axial load interaction diagram. And the first, or the an, an additional load that we need to find, or, or sorry, an additional capacity that we need to find, is the pure compression capacity if we include a minimum eccentricity requirement. So this uh, minimum eccentricity requirement is is kind of a, a cap here on the top portion of our diagram, and it essentially takes into account that even if you try to apply a load right at the centroid of the column, you won't be able to, and you'll always have some you know, some minimal moment on the column, which will decrease the pure compression capacity. So uh, we have different these different equations from our ACI 318, um, or the ACI 318 code. So here we're going to look at an axial force for a non-pre-stress member. So we'll use this first equation, and we're going to assume that we have ties and not spirals. So it, it's, I guess we, we are given that we have ties, not spirals, so it's a, re a square column, not a circular column, and we have uh, ties and not spirals provided. So we'll have a, a reduction here of 0.8. So with our axial force for non-pre-stress member with ties, we can use this equation here. Um, and again, our, our fee factor will be 0.65 for rectangular ties. So plugging all these values in, we can calculate our axial force with our min minimum eccentricity cap. So we'll have uh, phi pn equal to 0.8 
times 0 0.65 times 0 0.85 times 6 KSI times uh, 14 inches squared minus 8 times 0 0.6. And then we'll close our bracket. And then uh, plus, or sorry, I shouldn't have closed that one yet. Uh, and then plus uh, eight, number seven bars times 60 KSI. And then close the overall bracket. So we'll have a, a VPN then equal to 656.8. Kips. So this will be the cap that we provide on our diagram. We can then apply all of our different fee factors to our to our five points. So for pure compression, we'll have a fee of 0.65. Our balance point is our compression controlled point, so we'll also have a fee of 0.65. The tension controlled point uh, is the first point when we can start using a fee of 0.9, and our fee is going to vary linearly between our compression controlled and tension controlled points. So if we connect these with a straight line, then uh, it, it'll reasonably approximate or it, it'll represent our, our appropriate fee factor. Our pure moment, we're also going to have a fee of 0.9 and our pure tension will also have a fee of 0.9. So taking both our moment and axial loads times our fee, we can get our fee MN phi n diagram. So uh, here we have our factored diagram versus our, our unfactored diagram. And we include the um, pure compression with our minimum eccentricity point here, uh, which I, I'm highlighting. The next part of this problem is to develop a moment axial interaction diagram with a given Excel tool. Um, so essentially, we're just trying to get more points on our diagram and see how it compares to our simple five points. So if you take my class, then I'll give you this Excel spreadsheet. If, if you don't and you're just watching this on YouTube, then you can develop an Excel spreadsheet similar to this. Um, I give you some or a screenshot of some of the inputs and then a screenshot of some of the outputs. Um, so the, the C is varied um, to get the different points on the diagram. And for each C, we'll have a different concrete force and different stress and force in each one of our steel layers. And from these, we can find our moments and our axial loads. We can plot the points from our Excel tool next to the five points that we found by hand, uh, as shown here, for our factored and unfactored diagrams. And you can see that the five points does a, a pretty nice job on the, the tension side, so below balance. Um, but when we're on the compression side, we do lose a little bit of capacity here. So um, anyway, you can see how the, the upper side, not getting some of these points, we lose some of the top part of the curve. For the next part of the problem, we're going to find the capacity of the column with an eccentricity in both the X and the Y directions. And what this means is we'll have biaxial bending or bending in two directions for the column. To find the capacity, we're going to use the Bresler reciprocal method where the inverse of the capacity is just equal to the inverse of the capacity in the X plus the inverse of the capacity in the Y minus the inverse of the pure axial compression capacity. So we need to see how we can find the capacity in the X and capacity of the Y um, for this method. So the, the first step is we can find all of our forces in terms of C. And when we're doing this, we need to make some assumptions as to whether the reinforcement is in compression or tension and whether it's yielded or unyielded. I, I typically would say, right, I have an Excel sheet that I set up and in this I can cap the yield stress um, and you know have the sign set up so that um, positive is compression and negative is tension. But if we're doing this by hand, we need to make assumptions and then go back and check those assumptions. So here are the equations for top steel or layer three if it's unyielded or top steel if it's yielded, middle steel if it's unyielded, our concrete in terms of C and our bottom steel uh, if we're unyielded.
assuming tension uh, is positive here. So we're now ready to find our n, and we're going to find it in both the x and the y directions with our different eccentricities. So you'll see I, I provide both uh, in the same step. Uh, you know, if you wanted to separate it out and calculate your x, your x direction first and then your y direction, you're, you're free to do that as well. So here in the x direction, I'm assuming that our, our top compression steel is yielded, middle steel unyielded in compression. Uh, there's our concrete component. And here, the first point, I'm assuming that the uh, bottom steel is unyielded in tension. So for Y, we're assuming top steel is unyielded compression, middle steel is unyielded compression. Uh, here we have the concrete component again. And for the second point, we have a, a larger eccentricity, more moment. So we're assuming that we have uh, the bottom steel is yielded in tension. So next, we can find our moment. Um, our steel layer lever arms are going to be the same regardless of our neutral axis step. So both those will still have a uh, lever arm of five inches. We can find our concrete lever arm in terms of C, which I'm doing here. And then we can solve for our moment in terms of C using the same assumptions that we did up here. So taking our different forces times our lever arms, uh, making the same assumption as to whether we have a unyielded or yielded uh, layer of reinforcement. So here, the moment for our x direction and moment for our, our y direction. What we'll do now is we can take our moment equal to P times E and solve for C. So first we have our, our moment, so our moment equation equal to P, so the, the N equation that we had on the last slide times our eccentricity, six inches in the x direction. And solve, we can solve this equation then for c, and we'll get a c equal to 7.73 inches. So then we can check all of our different assumptions for our steel layers, and we'll find that our top steel layer is yielded, which is what we assumed. Our middle, st middle layer of steel is unyielded, and our bottom layer of steel is unyielded, and both those are, are what we assume, so we're okay there. So then we can continue with our uh, eccentricity, our calculation for the C in the Y direction. So setting our moment uh, equal to the axial force in terms of C times our eccentricity 10 inches, and we can solve for C uh, to be equal to 5.38 inches. We can then plug in our C and check our different assumptions. So here, our layer three, we assume that we were unyielded, and we are. Our, our layer two, we assumed we were unyielded, and we assume that uh, we had a, a compression in this layer. You can see we have a negative sign here, so negative means that we actually have tension. We don't need to go back and, and recalculate um, our C with this because uh, the sign automatically takes into account um, you know, our, our wrong assumption here. So if we realize that one of our layers was yielded when it really was unyielded or the other way around, then we would need to go back and recalculate. But just because we have a, a negative sign here, um, the, the negative sign will take care of itself in the C equation. Um, so anyway, the bottom layer we assumed was yielded and, and we are yielded, so we're okay in tension as well. So uh, we can keep going. Next, we need to plug in our C and calculate our, our actual P and X, so our, our, our N, in each eccentricity. And uh, we can find here our PNX is going to be equal to 445.1 kips. So this is our pure axial capacity, assuming a six inch eccentricity uh, in the X direction without any resistance factors. So to find our resistant resistance factor, we would need to find the uh, strain in our steel layer. So we did this on the last slide. We saw we weren't yielded, so we'll have a phi of 0.65. So to find our factor capacity, we take our 0.65 times the uh, piece of NX uh, to get our factor capacity to be equal to 289.3 kips. We can do the same thing in the Y direction with our 10 inch eccentricity. So we can find our piece of NY equal to the N that we found um, a couple slides ago for our 10 inch eccentricity. And we'll find a, a pure axial force, assuming a 10x, 
10 inch eccentricity equal to, or, or sorry, the axial capacity, assuming a 10 inch eccentricity equal to 246.6 kips. We can check our strain again. Here, the strain in our steel layer one is greater than yield, but it's less than our tension controlled limit. So we're in this transition zone. So we can use this equation from ACI 318 to calculate our fee of 0.79. So to find our factory capacity, we just take 0.79 times that 246.6 kips to get our, our fee P sub NY equal to 195.2. So we uh, have the pure, the pure compression capacity with the minimum eccentricity cap uh, from before. And then we can plug these three values into this equation and solve for phi sub PN. So this phi sub PN is the uh, the capacity, so the the axial load that we can apply when we have an eccentricity in the x and the y direction. For the next part of the problem, we're going to find a moment axial load interaction diagram including slenderness effects. So we're going to look at our diagram that we found before and we're going to modify it to include the effects of slenderness. So the first step would be to, or the first step in this procedure is to find the moment axial force interaction diagram for the section not including slenderness. So we did this earlier in the problem, so we can move on to our, our step two. Step two here is to determine our effective length, or K times L, using our alignment charts and our known end conditions. We were given that we have a simply supported non-sway column which will have a K equal to 1.0. So non-sway, we have a, a pin pinned, we're um, are restrained against, or we're braced here at the top, so we don't allow sway at the top. So we'll have a, a K of 1.0. Our unbraced length is going to be 14 feet. So 14 feet, we're going to convert all of our units to inches. So that'll be 168 inches. Our gross area, we have a 14 by 14 inch column, so we can find our gross area to be 196 square inches, our gross moment of inertia, so 14 times 14 to the third divided by 12 here to get that, and our radius of gyration, which is just our gross moment of inertia divided by our gross area. So we'll have the square root of 3,201 inches to the fourth divided by 196 inches squared. Uh, which will give us an r equal to 4.04. So we can find our slenderness ratio then by taking our k 1.0 times our l 196, or, or sorry, uh, 168, and then divided by 4.04. Which will give us a KL over R equal to uh, 41.6. So we can compare this KL over, R, KL over R to our slenderness limits for a braced frame. And we can see that our KL over R needs to be less than or equal to 22, uh, which is or, and less than or equal to 40. So our 41.6 is greater than 22, so we need to consider uh, slenderness effects. Because we need to consider slenderness, we'll need to determine our EI effective. Uh, to do this, we'll need to assume something for our, our beta sub DNS. So we were given that half the load is sustained. So this sus sustained load factor is going to be equal to 0.5. We're going to use the simplified equation from, three, from ACI 318 to calculate our EI effective. So we'll find our, our E, E sub C, using the ACI equation shown here. And we can plug that in with our gross moment of inertia and our beta sub DNS to find an EI effective as shown here, uh, 3,769,208 kip inches squared. So just, I'm keeping all of our units in kips and inches squared. Make sure that you, you're, you, know, you keep your units consistent in these equations. And uh, just, yeah, so keep track of, of your units as you're working through. So next we can plug this EI effective in with our, our KL uh, from before to find our critical buckling load, uh, P critical. 
So here we'll have our p critical is going to be equal to pi squared times ei. So we solve for that to be 3,769,208 kip inches squared. And then we're dividing by our k 1.0 times L168, and then squared. And we'll get our P critical to be 1,318 kips. So this is our, our critical buckling load. So we can also find our, our CM factor, which we'll need. And our CM factor, uh, we can calculate. If we don't have any transverse loads, we can calculate based on the a ratio of our end moments and assuming if we're in a single or double curvature. So here uh, we have single curvature equal end moments. So we'll have uh, M1 over M2 equal to negative one and a CM factor equal to 1.0. Continuing the procedure, our next step for each axial load in our diagram, we wanna calculate a moment magnifier. So for each of these points and each axial load, we're going to calculate a different moment magnifier. So our, our P sub n is going to, to change here depending on the point. So, uh, and note that if we're using ACI 318, then we have uh, this 0.75 uh, stiffness reduction factor that's included. And essentially this factor is based on the probability of, of under strength of a single isolated slender column. So then we can compute the slender, uh, the slender, the moment including the slenderness effects. And we can do this by just taking the moment at this point divided by our moment magnifier. And we need to set some limits here. So where our moment magnifier is greater than or equal to 1.0. So our slenderness effects are only going to decrease the capacity of the column. And also our, our P sub N needs to be less than or equal to 0.75 times P critical. So if we have an axial load that's greater than our, our, buckle, our critical buckling load or our factor critical buckling load, then our column's going to, to buckle. So that'll be an upper limit. So plugging in these values, we can see our unfactored diagram uh, without slenderness and then blue when we include slenderness effects uh, for the unfactored diagram. The uh, green diagram here is going from the uh, factor diagram without slenderness to the factor diagram with slenderness. So uh, here's the, you know, the, the final results for this part of the problem. The last part of the problem here is plotting the different design points and commenting on the design criteria. So we can see our first point here uh, falls inside both the short and slender column diagrams. So this point would satisfy the design uh, considering the short column and also uh, considering slenderness effects. So our, our, our column as shown would, the design would be satisfactory for point, point one. When we move up to point two here, uh, this column would be expected to, or I guess the design would not be satisfactory uh, if we consider slenderness effects but it would be okay for our, our, our short col column diagram. And you can see point two also falls inside the five point diagram. So uh, we would see that it would be okay for, the, for our, our short column effect, or for our short column design uh, if we only had found the five points. Point three, if we had only found the five points, point three would fall outside the diagram. But when we found uh, the additional points, we can see that point three actually still falls inside the short column diagram. And uh, point four here, this point is not designed to, or the column is not designed to, uh, to carry the loads from point four for either short column or slender column case. So uh, that concludes this design example problem.